Praise God. Uh, my Bible says the Holy Bible. I'm sure if you look at your Bible, it'll probably say the Holy Bible, the Word of God. And uh, God is holy, and so we must be holy. Praise God. I don't know why I said that, because that's not what I'm talking about. But God wanted me to say it. Um, just before the, I read the scriptures, I want to give you just a little bit of, uh, of, um, uh, of what's happening just before this scripture. It was the feeding of the 5,000, and uh, the disciples were tired, and Jesus had sent them on, and he said, I will disperse the crowd, I will, uh, I will send them away, uh, but I want you to depart. And so... Uh, in Mark chapter 6, verse 45, it starts and it says, Straightway he constrained his disciples to get in the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethesda, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed them by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And he went into un, them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves upon, beyond measure and wonder. It occurs right after the miracle. But there's something that I want to talk about tonight. We, we talk about this verse of Scripture. We use it uh, quite uh, frequently. But the thing that is interesting to me is that he saw them. He was in prayer on top of the mountain. And he saw them. How can we have anything better than Jesus praying for us. He saw them. He saw the trouble that they were in. He saw the wind and how that it was contrary unto them. And he decided to go unto them. And I just wonder at that. You know, sometimes we feel like we're in this all alone. Or, or sometimes we get into a situation or we have a problem in our life or we have something that is just not um, we can't handle it. We don't have the answer. And then I, rem I remind myself in those situations that even Jesus looked to Peter and said, Peter, Satan desires to have you, to sift you. And sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we feel like we are being sifted, but not alone. Jesus is praying for Peter. He's praying for us. And he sees, and we're going to have problems. We're going to have uh, different things that are going to take place. Look at uh, 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 Elijah. He called down fire and destroyed prophets. And then in the next chapter, he's running from Jezebel. You know, we're going to have problems. But what happens? God sent an angel right away. Okay, so you had problems. Here's some food. Here's some drink. He needed strength. Sometimes we just need a little strength. Sometimes we just need a little bit of time, you know, to, to just go ahead and, and feel that strength again. The amazing thing is God will send something to strengthen you. And your strength is going to be a supernatural strength. Because he went 40 days on that strength. 40 days on that strength. 
the disciples, they had to work hard. They had to uh, strive against the streams of life. They must have expected to be tossed about. They were persecuted by their enemies. The disciples in a storm. But who intercedes for them? Who intercedes for us? Jesus himself will intercede for us. I believe that. I really do. If you have a problem, if you have something that just seems like it's not going away, Jesus is ready to intercede. God bless. He will be there for you. You can depend on it. That's who our God is. He is wonderful. I felt his presence in the worship. I felt his presence in my prayer this morning. What a privilege that a mortal human being can feel the divine presence of an eternal God. A God so big that he covers the universe. Heaven is his throne. He said, and earth is my footstool. So travel wherever you may be. You won't get away from it. The psalmist said, if I take the wings of the dove and I fly away, he'll be there. If I dig into hell, he's there. Whither shall I flee from the presence of God? Jonah tried it. Didn't do a good job, did he? Jonah had a rotten attitude. God said, do it, and he said, no. That's a short answer. But when he was down in that fish's belly in the bottom of the ocean, he regretted that no. He had three whole days in that slimy seawater and Seaweeds and stink. Any of you ever cleaned a fish? Cut him open? Well, he was in the stinkiest part of that whale. And he wanted out. <laughs> I'm gonna, he said, I, I don't know where I am, God, but in my mind, I'm looking toward Jerusalem. And if you'll let me out of here, I'll pay my vows. I'll go. <laughs> it's amazing what some people get into and God has to work on them. But I tell you what, when he decides to turn his focus on you, <laughs> you better say, yes, 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 Lord, yes. <laughs> For the last uh, two studies, and this is the end third study on the joy of for the journey and if you don't have joy on your journey you're missing something great and I do see people in my life I've seen quite a few I've pastored some never seemed like they had any joy you didn't see them smile they never seemed like uh, they were excited about anything just totally platonic and uh, but I'll tell you this you can't get next to Jesus without getting excited. In his presence, you cannot be platonic. And I wish the Holy Ghost was like baptism. Some people need a good refreshing of the Holy Ghost. And if we could do it by baptizing, we would. Only this time we'd hold them under a little longer. Okay, let's do a recap. We talked about the source of joy in his presence, his word. If you're a soul winner, you're a person with joy. And without joy, you can't win the lost. Oh, no. No, you sit there in, in the doll drums and try to teach the Bible to somebody, and they say, I don't know what kind of religion it is, but I don't want it. They don't like it, so I'm sure I wouldn't like it either. 
I heard a teacher one time in quite a large Bible study, and he taught the Bible, and I listened to him several Sundays. And I thought, how in this world can anybody take this exciting Word of God and put you to sleep with it? But that's what he did. So there was joy in Samaria when the gospel came. The miracles were there. They baptized him in Jesus' name. And there's joy in trusting God. Joy can be a result of righteousness. You know, Solomon lost, lost his joy because he got away from God. He had everything else. And we, we'll make a reference to that tonight. He had houses, vineyards, chariots, gardens, orchards, irrigation for his trees and his, his plants. He had servants, silver, gold, singers, 700 wives, 300 cucumber vines. <laughs> he had musicians, and he had admiration of the world, but he was not happy at the end. We read Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, second chapter, and he said, all is vanity and vexation. He said, I hated my labor. For all of that, he walked away from God, he had anything he wanted. See, King Saul's joy was taken away because of jealousy. We're going to talk about joy again. There was joy at creation, Job 38. First chapter through the seventh, I'll read one, you read the second, we'll read responsive. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Who's laid the measure thereof, if you know, and who stretched a line upon it? When the morning, this, look at this one. When the, all this happened, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When God performs this joy. Amen. I remember what, 14 years ago, we moved into this building, 13 or 14. You were just a kid when you came to this church, and you did grow up. Whole family of kids, and now they're two of us married. And I think Brother Rodriguez is hiding the girls. If that's not so, you better let me know. But we started the church in our home, my wife and I, and uh, we had uh, the first uh, Easter, we had uh, two people. Started teaching Bible studies within two weeks, and we got our living room full. Then we moved into a park district, and then we needed two services, so we had to use two different park districts. And then we moved into the Episcopal Church, we were there for a while, and they threw us out, said they needed the space, and it would seat probably 250, and uh, they were running about 18. They needed the space, <laughs> and we understood. But when this building was up, brand new and all designed and landscaped, and by the way, Brother Denning drew the plan for this lovely building. He laid it out. And what a magnificent job he did. But when we walked in here, they couldn't have been any happier at Solomon's Temple. There was joy. From the very start, there was joy. And then Jesus found joy. Hebrews 12 and 2, in a very unusual place. Paul, the writer of Hebrews said, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith 
who for the joy, everybody say joy, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What gave Jesus joy? The joy that was set before him was the consummation of the plan of the ages, the church. All through the Old Testament, the Israelites were known as the people of God. Jehovah was their God, but they didn't know the name of that God. But in the New Testament, when Jesus died upon the cross and we could receive baptism in his name, he was going to have a people for his name's sake. A people who would bear his name. That was the joy. The church was going to be born, not just anything, not just any people, but of all people, the church would be born and that church would bear the name of Jesus. What did the disciples get persecuted for? It wasn't talking in tongues. No, it wasn't for the miracles they performed. It was the name of Jesus. And Jesus told them, you'll be persecuted of all nations because of me. Amen. Aren't you glad you got that name? I love that old song. His name is engraved on my heart. And from him I will never depart. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior. His name is engraved on my heart. So he looked ahead to the church. Luke 14, 28 and 29. The writer Luke says, For much of which of you intending to build a tower, or it could be a house or a barn, sets not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it. Lest haply, after he's laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock. There's no joy in not planning. Financial integrity can bring you some joy. You know, somebody who squanders every dime they ever got hold of, they do all right. They live for a while, but the sad endings when they get old and they can't work, and then they have nowhere to go, and they have no money to live on. Hello? <laughs> quiet, quiet when you talk about that. Financial integrity. Learn how to save some money. Because there's going to be some tough spots financially in every life. And if every dime you get a hold of, you've already got 10 different things you want to spend it on, uh, throw your catalogs away. Quit watching the ads on TV and the paper. Amen? One of the things of financial integrity is our tithing. The first tenth belongs to God. If we don't give it to him, we've robbed him. You're in trouble with God. And I, I want to warn you something. I don't know if I'm warning anybody that's guilty or not. But God will collect what he's owed. Oh, it's, it's the truth. Car repairs, house repairs, lawnmower repairs. Man, he can, he can collect it all in a short time. It, it pays to give God his tenth. And not because you got to. You have to. But he loves a cheerful giver. The ability to make sound decisions brings joy. Now on this financial integrity... Too many people pick the fruit before it's ripe. As soon as they get one of those credit cards. Oh, my, my, my. There's no limit. Sky is the limit. They put a $3,000 limit on this card, and I can put $3,000 on it. And the next thing you know, you're paying 25% interest. And, friend, there ought to be a law against that, but there's not. Just warning some of you young people. 
and maybe a few of your old ones. You see, debts and joy are not good bedfellows. Okay? First Thessalonians 5 and 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. If you will give thanks, give a thankful heart. I've said this before. It's worth repeating. Brother Pugh told me, I have never seen a happy person that did not have a thankful heart. Amen. There's joy in accomplishing. Remember the story of Ruth, Ruth, the second chapter. It says, so she gleaned. Now, Ruth was a Moabite. She was not an Israelite. But she had married an Israelite, and he had died. So she had rights through her dead husband. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. That's about three pints. That's a quart and a half. That's all she had for the whole day. And she took it. And went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw, that was Naomi, what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was suffice. So they ate some of it, and then they put the rest of it away for another day. This woman, Ruth, married Boaz. From them they had a son named Obed. From Obed, he had a son named Jesse. Nice to see you, Jesse. <laughs> Different Jesse here. He wasn't back there. And Jesse had a son named David. Amen. There's joy in laboring. Some people think that work is like a plague, but it's not. There's joy in laboring and seeing your comp accomplishments. And, of course, you're always going to have cycles in living, the ups and downs, the mountains, the valley, the tides of life. But joy is a choice, and it determines the quality of life you have. Let me say that again. Joy is a choice. I choose to be happy. I could be sad. I lost my darling. I could be so sad. And I have had some deep valleys over it. I told you that I had the joy of the Lord all through it. But I neglected to tell you that the great people of this church reached out their arms to me and wrapped them around me. And I felt that deep consolation from this church. God love you and bless you and thank you. But joy is a choice. Jesus wants you to have joy. He wants it. Now, let's go back to Solomon. I'm closing this lesson, the last one. Let's go back to Solomon. Solomon, in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, listed all the things that he had done, all the accomplishments that he had made. He was an engineer. He was a genius engineer. He was a genius farmer. He was a genius in all plant life. He was a genius in the moving of water and, and irrigation and putting water where it would, was needed to be. He was a genius in building, in architecture. You name it. He collected rare treasures from around the world. He was the envy of every king and queen of the world. And yet he wrote that second chapter at the end of it. He said, all is vanity. Soap bubbles. Doesn't mean a thing. Right? Don't ever forget that. He had everything but God. Everything. If there's ever proof that you can't have joy and be happy with things, Solomon is a prime example. So in 1 Kings 11, 1 to 4, tells you how he got in trouble. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, 
women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. And the Hittites were hated of Israel. God hated the Hittites. So it was bad. Verse 2. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. Now I'm, I'm very perplexed. How do you love a thousand women? You reckon he had a favorite wife? If he had a favorite wife, 999 of them hated her. <laughs> this doesn't quite get through to my skull. But that's what it said, verse 3. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Isn't that sad? Okay, let's go back to his glory days. When the Queen of Sheba came, this was when he was serving God. This was before he got involved in all those wives. 1 Kings 10, first verse. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, notice, concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. She had heard, he knows everything. You ask anything, he'll give you an answer for it. She said, do you think... I've got problems I've never been able to solve. I've talked to the wisest men I've ever met, and they couldn't solve them either. So she came with these questions to Solomon. Verse 2, And she came to Jerusalem with a very great cane, with camels that bear spices, and with very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat for his table, and the setting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and he is his ascent, in which he went up to the house of God, there was no more spirit in her. How about that? And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and thy wisdom. Howbeit I believe not the words until I came, and my eyes have seen it, and behold, the half has not been told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Notice, happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he the king to be judgment and justice. What a compliment. Solomon is sitting on the throne of ivory and gold. Gold was like nickels in the reign of Solomon. In fact, David collected a lot of gold. David had gold and silver and copper and iron already enough to build the temple. He personally gave $80 million in gold for the temple. 
the elders, the rich people of his reign, gave over another hundred million. There was at least two hundred million dollars worth of gold when Solomon started, when he began to do the temple. He did not have to spare any expense. David was going to build it till God stopped him. God gave David the plans, and he wanted to build the temple. He said, I live in a beautiful house, but the house of God is in tent, and it's not right. But God said, you got blood on your hands. You're a man of war. Your son will build it. And so he collected uh, the building materials and much, much, much gold. What a beginning Solomon had. He went to Gibeon. As soon as Solomon had been anointed king, he went to Gibeon. And there he offered up 1,000 sacrifices. That's quite a herd. He personally offered 1,000 sacrifices. He slept while he was there. And God came to him in a dream. And he said, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon says, I'll tell you what. I'm but a child who was 40 years old. But what an attitude he had in the beginning. I'm but a child. And I, you've I've been made king over this, thy so great a people. The greatest people on the face of the earth. Don't forget, David had a powerful kingdom. He said, I've been made king over this, thy so great a people. And I'm such a child, I don't know how to go out or come in. If you would just give me wisdom to judge your people, I'd be so happy, Lord. What a, what a request. This the king is asking to serve. I'm asking you, God, not because of me, but because of the people. I want to lead these people. I want to serve them well. I want to be a king as good as my father was. I want this kingdom to flourish and prosper under my leadership. Give me wisdom, Lord, to know what to do. And look at First Kings Chapter 3, verse 12. This is God speaking. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before you, neither after you shall any arise like unto you. Nobody's going to be richer and no one is going to be wiser. Verse 13, and I have also, get, you know, God always throws in a bonus. When you do the will of God and you love his word and you love following him and you love to worship that name of Jesus, there's always a bonus. Here's what God said. I have also given ye that which you have not asked. You only ask for wisdom. But uh, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. What a promise. You're going to be the king of all kings on the earth. You're going to be the most looked up king, the most revered king, the richest and the wisest of all the kings in the world. Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. You want to read his writings? Read the Proverbs, and I think most of the Ecclesiastes. He wrote 1,005 songs. God used this man when he was humble in his own eyes. Amen? They built the temple. They brought the cedars from Lebanon. Hiram, king of Lebanon, cut them, brought them down by the sea. They hauled them up to Jerusalem, 50 miles up the mountain. 
they brought the timbers. The rocks were hewn out in the rock quarries. And the temple, listen to this, was put together without the sound of a hammer. Everything was done off the scene. And when it was brought in, it fit perfectly. There were some geniuses building this temple. The day of the temple of the dedication came. And everybody wants to offer sacrifice. They're offering thousands of sacrifice. No place on that altar is not near big enough for the sacrifice. And so Solomon goes out in the court. This is when the joy was in his heart, in the kingdom. When you do the will of God, there's joy in your life. Yes, sir. And he goes out in the court, and he hallows the whole court and makes it an altar so they can offer the sacrifices that have been brought in. Then he had a brass stage made. And when it was time for the dedication, he got up on that brass stage above the heads of the people so he could see all of them. And he knelt down in humility and outstretched his arms toward the people. And he began to pray. He prayed a prayer. And when he, he did, God came down. The house was filled with the glory of God. He said, now God... Perhaps this people will fail you and you withhold rain from them. But if they do, Lord, and they turn to this temple, it was the focal point of Israel, just like Mecca is for the Muslims. Only God's not there. But God said, I will dwell in the Holy of Holies, on the mercy seat beneath the wings of the angels. God was there. He said, and if they, they have sinned and caused you trouble and they turn to you, Lord, and they ask forgiveness, would you answer their prayer? And perhaps God's strangers will come by and they'll see your glory here and they'll want to pray. And if they pray from this place, would you hear their prayer? And then he said, God, perhaps... Do the sins of Israel, we may be carried, some of your people may be carried captive in a strange land. And if they do because of their sins, and they decide to turn to you, and they look to this temple, would you forgive their sins? And he goes all the way through all of this. Second Chronicles seven fourteen, And the Lord says, if my people, which are called by my name, you got to have the name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Oh, what a God. What a God. I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. That happened down in Babylon. They prayed, and God had them there for a time, but he heard their prayer, and he brought them back again to rebuild the temple and the walls and the city of Jerusalem. If my people, folks, we can still use this scripture. My people, we are the people of God. We bear that name. The apostolics are shunned aside by the whole church world because we use the name. And the New Testament is full. Whatever you do in word or in name, do it all in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. That name, I, a lot of people have been healed in baptism in that name. Uh, our missionaries go overseas 
some of the areas they go, many people are demon-possessed. Let me tell you something. You will never cast a demon out without using the name of Jesus. There will not be any demon go out. So the queen of Sheba saw Solomon. Twenty years after the dedication, the queen of Sheba came. And she saw all that. She saw his glory. She saw the temple. And it doesn't record it, but undoubtedly she saw his palace. And again, if the temple took seven years and the palace took 14, you got an idea what he was working with. But Solomon gave advice that he never kept himself. He gave it, but he didn't keep it. Proverbs 9, 13, 18, look what Solomon said. He's talking to his son. He said, son, I want to give you some warnings. And then fell in his own trap. He says, a foolish woman is clamorous. It means she's noisy and insistent. She's simple and knoweth nothing. For she set the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers or people who go right on their ways. And whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him that wants understanding, she says to him, this is this foolish woman, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. For he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. What advice he gave and fell into the same trap. These women that he married, for a while they were content, but they kept working on him. And after years in his old age, he just gave in and he built houses to their gods. G-O-D-S, little g. He built houses and he failed. He had lost everything that was important. He loved many strange women and his wives turned away his heart after other gods. He got away from wanting to be a servant to wanting to be more of a king. Let me tell you Solomon's biggest problem, and t listen to this and, and let it get in your heart. Solomon's biggest problem was he was not accountable to anybody. No one. That's why God put preachers and leaders in the church, elders, godly people, pastors, evangelists, teachers, so God put them in the church for leadership. I, I got a call from someone just today. They're pastoring a church. And they, he said, I got this lady in my church. Basically, he said she's not accountable to anybody. But as soon as a new convert comes in, she gets a hold of them. And we've lost about 20 new converts. What do I do with her? Throw her out. You think I'm kidding? When a lamb is lost, you go get it and carry it home. But when a wolf gets in the pack, gets in the herd, you hit him on the head with a club. Because you can talk to him all you want. That won't persuade that wolf. Wolf, that's bad. It's very bad. People won't like you. You won't have anywhere to go. No, fooey. Hit him on the head. You've never seen my club, have you? He forgot about serving, and he was accountable. Nobody could tell him. You see, that's why God put a pastor in the church. Sometimes people do so well for a while, and something disturbs their prayer life. And when your prayer life gets disturbed, you get carnal. You cannot stay spiritual and not pray. 
And when you get carnal, the world doesn't look so bad. There are little things on the fringe of the world that almost look good. And it's easier sometimes to step out of that narrow path and get on the broad way. And that's what happened to Solomon. It wasn't a thousand wives that knocked on his door and demanded that he take action. That wasn't the way it happened. Remember the story of Samson and Delilah? Oh, she was beautiful too. Yeah. Samson, you don't love me, honey. Here I'm keeping you in my house. I'm cooking for you. I'm cleaning for you. I'd do this the rest of my life, and I'd be happy doing it, Solomon. You know how much I love you. Now just tell me, what is it? It's... And the dummy gives her a big smackaroo and tells her exactly what she wants to hear. And she dopes him up and puts him to sleep. Did you know that every time, this, this is not the first time it happened, but every time before this that it happened, the guys who were coming to catch him didn't come on the scene until they saw Samson, whether he'd fail or succeed. And they were wise because every time he broke the bonds. But this time, they did not hesitate. You read it in the book. They immediately came in. They punched out his eyes. They put him at the mill. These are good things the devil will give you. He was a man that was free. But Samson, he had a problem too. He was not accountable. Folks, when pastor teaches from the word of God and out of his heart, listen to it. If he gets in false doctrine, ride him out of town on a rail. But if he stays if he stays in that book, obey it. And sometimes you'll need advice. Some place you're not sure if you ought to go or not. Something you're not sure. The fact of the matter is you, you really know it's wrong. You just want to pass it and say it's okay. <laughs> and he says, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the narrow way. And then you get all mad. I wonder where there's a pastor I could get that would tell me I could do this. Stand with me. What an example of joy and then lost joy. Everything in the world, there was nothing. He said, Solomon said, I kept back nothing. Of anything that I desired, he could get it. Anything natural. But, oh, friend, without Jesus, this whole world is going to pass away. And everything you see and handle is going to be burned up. There's not going to be anything left on this earth. God is going to set it on fire and renovate this whole earth. And he's going to make a new earth. In the book, wherein dwells righteousness. He's going to cleanse it from all the sins and all the evil. I don't know where you want to be, but I want to walk with him. I want to be able to call on him and know that he's watching me and that I've been faithful. I want to be able to worship him out of a pure and clean heart. I want to obey this word of God and I want above all things the joy for my journey let's come and pray I have decided 
to follow Jesus. I am decided to follow Jesus.